It's one of the most unusual mysteries we've ever covered at Court TV, with one of the most unusual suspects. It was the morning of Saturday, May 26th, 1990, and Marlene Warren was at home with her son and some of his friends. Her husband was out, headed to the racetrack. The doorbell rang, and when Marlene opened the door, she was greeted by a clown who was holding balloons and flowers. Was this a surprise for Marlene? Was someone thinking about her? Yes, it was a surprise. And yes, someone certainly was thinking about her because that clown brought a third item to the door that day, a gun. Marlene Warren was shot and killed and the clown got away in a white sedan. The case remained unsolved until 2017 when a woman named Sheila Keen Warren was arrested for the murder. The reason the suspect and the victim share the same last name is because Sheila married Marlene's husband after she was murdered. Tonight, we take a closer look at this case as the trial is set to begin this month in Florida. The prosecutor bringing the charges joins us live and we'll take a look at some letters sent by the defendant to her husband, who once again is also the former husband of the victim. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And the next hour, get ready. Please sit down. This is a story unlike any we've ever told before. Um, but let me begin with where we are. It's October, right? And, and you know, you walk around the town square, you go to the stores. It's the spookiest time of the year. You're getting ready for Halloween, where everyone plays dress up. Right? Whether it's the kids or the adults, we all do it to a certain extent. Sometimes people dress up to go to work. And you can be anything you want to be, right? You can, you can be a cowboy, you could be a football player, you could be a witch, or maybe you could be a scary clown. Now, the great thing about scary clowns this time of year is that when we come across these scary clowns, whether we're at a maybe one of the attractions down in Orlando, Florida, it's, you know, haunted Halloween nights, or you go to a local haunted house, or you're just wandering through the neighborhood on Halloween, no one really gets hurt. You might get a little scared, right? We might get a little nervous. Like I remember I went to one of those haunted nights uh, down at uh, Universal Studios years ago, and my daughter was young then, and I mean, these clowns were coming out with the <clears throat> fake buzz saws and they were jumping out from everywhere and she was clinging to me for like two hours, like this, just gripping me. But no one gets hurt. We get scared, we don't get hurt. That wasn't the case for Marlene Warren. Marlene Warren was murdered by a clown. Did you, did you hear me? Murdered by a clown. Now, I don't think this was a real professional clown, like the one that goes to uh, the, the clown college down in, down in another part of Florida, um, but someone who was dressed up like a clown that day, rang her doorbell, bringing flowers and balloons. You know, you see some, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, I have, like someone driving down the street dressed up like a clown, and like, oh, must be going to somebody's birthday party or something or to deliver something to someone's house. And that's what this scene sort of looked like. But that's not what it was. And now, Sheila Keen Warren is accused of being a killer clown, of literally dressing up like someone who's gonna go entertain kids at a party, or someone who's gonna make a delivery to wish someone, I don't know, Happy birthday, happy anniversary, have a great day, or, you know, congratulations for whatever. But instead is accused of doing that to let the victim relax for a moment just before being shot and killed. Now, for those of you who don't know the layered details of this story, Court TV anchor Ted Rollins has more for us tonight. <laughs> 
May 26, 1990 started out as a typical day for the Warren family, living on this quiet street in Wellington, Florida, an equestrian community just north of Miami. It was just a regular morning. You know, we were planning the day and eating breakfast. Joe Ahrens was 21 at the time. He'll remember that Saturday for the rest of his life. A clown carrying balloons and flowers showed up at their door. Joe's mom, Marlene, answered the door and thought it was a nice gift, saying, oh, how nice. The clown dropped the balloons and flowers and fatally shot Marlene twice in the face. I was at a loss. Um, <clears throat> I, I felt my heart, my soul just get ripped out of my body. And it, uh, it was a tragic thing. Aaron's heard the gunfire and ran to find his mother in a pool of blood. He saw the clown walk away and disappear into a white Chrysler LeBaron. He had no clue who the killer was, and neither did the police. Investigators found the Chrysler LeBaron in a Winn-Dixie parking lot about five miles away from where the murder occurred. And inside, they found a number of hairs. Some of them looked to be orange-yellow, like they would have come from an acrylic wig. Apparently, the DNA process at the time wasn't up to the task of identifying exactly what was in those fibers and, and hair samples, too. The case would go cold for decades. Then, finally, after 27 years, a break, new DNA testing led authorities to Sheila Keen Warren. Testing has evolved over time, and there were apparently some pieces of evidence that they wanted to re-examine, and they sent it to an FBI lab. And it's unclear which part of that led to the arrest, but something stuck, and that's how they were able to make the arrest. In 2017, Sheila Keen Warren was arrested and charged with first-degree murder for the death of Marlene Warren. She took my life <clears throat> um, out of selfishness and greed. Uh, my mom was an angel. You know, she was uh, good to everyone. She was honest. She was... Anyone that knew her knew she had a big heart. Authorities suspected that Sheila was having an affair with Marlene's husband, Michael. Michael and Sheila eventually married in 2002 and were living together at the time of her arrest. There were many twists in the trail that led investigators to Sheila Keen Warren, one of them a deathbed confession. After her arrest, a man by the name of John Moran Jr. told detectives what he knew about the case, saying his dying father shared a secret with him back in 1996, that evidence allegedly related to Marlene's murder was hidden in a car underwater. My father told me everything that happened before he died. I knew where the car was, I knew who planned it, I knew where the gun was at. John Moran Sr. worked with Marlene's husband, Michael Warren. Warren was questioned, but never charged in his wife's murder. He was a used car dealer who was later arrested on charges of grand theft, odometer tampering, and racketeering. Moran told his son before he died that Warren may have had something to do with his wife's death. On his deathbed, he told me that car would get me anything I ever wanted for Mike Warren. Moran Jr. told detectives that Michael Warren tried to bribe him. His father had told him where he could find the getaway car and all of the evidence they were looking for. Moran Jr. led police to a Palm Beach canal where he says his father had dumped the evidence. However, investigators did not find what they were looking for, a clown costume or the murder weapon. Without that evidence, police can't make a case against Sheila Keen Warren, says her lawyer, Richard Lubin. I do know enough about this case, not from the discovery process, but from my knowledge of the case, that she's innocent. But Joe Aaron says he's always had a hunch about the killer and believes the right person is on trial. I remember one of the detectives, Williams, uh, told me, um, Joe, we're going to find out who did this no matter what, even if it takes 25 years. And that's what I held on to. Amazing. Amazing. Joining us tonight in West Palm Beach, Florida, Palm Beach County State Attorney Dave Arenberg is with us. Great to see you, Dave. And in Stewart, Florida, an attorney who worked with the Warren family at one time, Christopher DeSantis is with us. Uh, great to see you as well, Christopher. Uh, Dave, let me start with you. 
Um, I'm looking at the calendar. 1990 murder. 2017, she's arrested. It's 2022. 2022. It's taken a long time to get here. Usually they say prosecutors' cases don't get better, they get worse. Why is this one getting better? Well, it's good to be back with you, Vinny. It's tough to try a cold case, especially when it takes five years from the time of arrest. So now we're talking about 1990 to today, 32 years. And I wouldn't say it gets better. I just think that the evidence for us is pretty clear. And we would not be prosecuting this case unless we believed in good faith we can get a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. And we look forward to this finally going to trial next Friday. Is there any continuing investigation looking at anyone else who might be involved here? I can't talk about that, Vinny. I can tell you uh, that we are always listening if witnesses or if this defendant wants to spill the beans about other people. But right now, the only person that we have on trial is Sheila Keen Warren. And there's a reason for that because we have enough evidence to believe that we can get a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. If there was enough evidence against other people for us to charge, we would do so. Christopher DeSantis, uh, you represented Marlene's son, um, connected to all this. Uh, what are your thoughts, though, as here we are in October of 2022, uh, getting ready for this trial to begin? What, 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 what do you think of that? I mean, you, you practice law, you know the way the system works. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts, first of all, are that money doesn't bring happiness because I think that's what this case was about. I mean, when I represented Joey, I, I was involved in the exchange of one or more checks that uh, were for Mr. Warren's business that were signed by uh, Mrs. Warren. And afterwards, uh, to some associates of mine, he was very concerned about when he was going to get his money as opposed to who killed his wife. Uh, but you know, my position has been the same, you know, from the very beginning. Uh, it was my belief that, uh, well, essentially he asked me at one point after uh, Joey's case was done, uh, a classical law school question, which is, is can a husband inherit if he murders his wife. And when he initially said that, I was walking out of the room in a different context in which we were related, but we had a homicide issue. So the question wasn't totally out of line. And uh, it's like, what are you talking about? Right? We sat down and Joey was on one side, Michael Warren was on the other side. And I said, look, you know, the law is that you gotta be convicted of murder. So if you didn't do it, obviously you can inherit. If somebody else did it, obviously uh, th that's their problem. But you know what happens is if in fact uh, somehow you were involved, but they can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And I had a degree uh, or a background, in, I'll say, in forensic uh, or, or physical anthropology. And so I just threw out in a flippant example of, let's say you wore a clown suit and so that no one could ascertain what your features were. You know, that way would be theoretically how someone would, could get away with it. And as soon as I said it, I said, Sh I should have shut my mouth. And I was surprised that Joey didn't jump up at the time because Joey, he, he was elated. He's sitting right next to me. He had, I thought he had to be hearing it. And Marlene wasn't there at the time. And uh, what happened a little bit later on was is that we walked down the hallway and out of the elevator comes Marlene. And I'm saying, oh boy, what do I do? Because if I tell her this, and it was just an incident, stupid barroom type or, or you know, drinking type of question, then I've cooked their marriage. On the other hand, yeah, what happened, happened. It, it's unbelievable. And, and I just wanna make sure everyone understood what happened here. You had a conversation with Marlene's husband. She, he's asking you, about inheriting money, if a husband kills a wife, and then in the conversation, you sort of flippantly say, well, they can't identify him if he dresses up like, if someone dresses up like a clown. And then the man you had the conversation with, his wife ends up getting murdered by someone dressed up like a clown. I got it right, right? That's exactly what happened? Yes. Wow. Well, more, more, more significantly than that, 
was is that I was shared offices out in Singer Island at the time. And uh, he was then uh, apparently aggressively trying to figure a way of how to get his money, which made things more suspicious. And all the lawyers were doing in the firm is they were locking their doors because they didn't want a clown to show up at their offices. Unbelievable. Now, Dave Varenberg, I know you can't comment any, on any of that. I wouldn't put you in that position. But I'm going to ask you about uh, there's, a, there's a motion to compel that is pending involving the clown sighting file. And the defendant, Sheila Keen Warren, moves to court for an order directing the state to search for and produce the following evidence. The clown sighting file. According to the initial lead detective, uh, immediately after the press release, they received numerous clown sightings and citizen leads, all of which were evaluated and placed in the clown sighting file. Um, what's the status of the clown sighting file? And is that something that you've come across in the office? Uh, Vinny, our prosecutors have turned over everything uh, to the defense that we're required to, according to the discovery rules, as far as this file, if this file existed, they'd be getting it. And so that should tell you enough. Uh, I am looking forward to the trial starting next Friday. And although I can't talk about the evidence in particular uh, in this case, yeah, there were a lot of leads over the years. There are a few bits that I am allowed to say, Vinny, because it was in the four corners of the probable cause affidavit. For example, you know, the, the defendant here, Sheila Keen Warren, she bought a clown costume the day before the murder. And a person who looked like her, similar features as the defendant, was seen buying flowers and balloons on the day of the murder. Also, we know that the defendant was having an extramarital affair with uh, the uh, husband of the victim, Michael Warren, and they got married afterwards. And that Chrysler Baron that you showed in the video package that was used in the crime, well, that Chrysler Baron was tied to Michael Warren. So, yeah, we've got evidence, and there's more out there that I'm not allowed to discuss. We'll have to wait for the trial. But as far as this file, if there is anything like that that existed, we would be turning it over. Absolutely. I mean, the, the way the case is described, to me, it's a case, and, and, and it's common sense. You know, put two and two together here, folks. All right, we don't have the eyewitness. We don't have the confession. We don't have a video. It was 1990. Not everything was videotaped in 1990. But my goodness, I, I, you think about some of this cir the circumstances surrounding this, uh, pointing in one direction, and obviously, he's presumed in, or she's presumed innocent, and they'll they'll make their case. Um, let me ask you, Christopher, um, uh, Joe Aaron's your your client, Marlene's son. Um, have you spoken with him recently? And and his thoughts I about spoken. No, not since the day that I made the comment to Mr. Warren. Oh, really? That's that's I've fascinating. Never spoken. Never compared notes. The only thing is, uh, intermittently, I've heard reports that Mr. Uh, Warren was with uh, the, you know, his current wife even earlier than the date of marriage uh, in, in different places. I think there was a sighting of him and his wife, or, or Sheila, in Michigan in, in the late 90s. But uh, so it was going, and it was repeated, but one of the attorneys in the office apparently knew that he was having an affair back then with with her and uh, knew about you know, his other problems with it. I mean, had I known any of his background, I never would have said anything, but... Oh, obviously. Uh, I mean, I, and, and I hope you don't carry any guilt with you. I mean, that's that would be ridiculous. Oh, yeah. I mean, for a long, long time, I mean, I at least weekly, I mean, Marlene was a wonderful, wonderful person. And all she cared about was her sons. And she used to actually frame herself in, in a picture. You know, he, Mr. Warren would always sit in the background and he would basically uh, you know, be off a little bit to the side and she would frame herself over so they would always look like a family. But she was always happy and perky and, and, and considerate of her son, which is really hard given the, the you know, enormous amount of stress that there was during Joey's situation it was a horrific situation that they had and fortunately uh you know, joey was cooperative and the judge was compassionate and as far as that particular case it worked out well but the rest of it i mean what i'm really surprised about it is the coincidence apparently marlene had all kinds of pictures of clowns in her home and 
uh, again, I mean, just the sheer coincidence. I never knew anyone who had a clown fascination with anything. Wow. But uh, apparently she didn't. That may have just you know, been a perfect match. Yeah, and put her more at ease when she's opening the door. All right, Christopher DeSantis, Dave Arenberg are going to stay with us. Uh, we're going to talk more about this uh, killer clown trial. It's coming up right here. You'll see it on your front row seat to justice. In the meantime, coming up next hour. In Portland, Oregon, outrage tonight as a serial rapist is set to be released. His name is Richard Gilmore, and he admitted to raping nine victims and was prosecuted for raping a 13-year-old girl. Tonight, we try to figure out why anyone would let him out before serving his full sentence. 0433. A clown pulled out a gun and shot her twice in the face. There's some very excited young people came running out saying something on the order of they've shot Joey's mother. It was uh, one of the worst days of my life. Could you tell by their gait or by their mannerisms whether the person was a man or a woman? How often do you hear of a, a mom being shot at point blank range by a killer dressed as a clown? A clown with balloons and flowers? And a gun? Cold cases, we kind of, we have a big puzzle. And some of the pieces are already filled in. One little bizarre incident and story after another. Marlene was outstanding. Do anything for anybody. Miss uh, Sheila Keen Warren has been indicted for first degree murder with a firearm. I do know enough about this case that she's innocent. We are talking about the case against Sheila Keen Warren, the accused killer clown, 1990, accused of shooting and killing Marlene Warren, dressed as a clown, balloons, flowers, and a gun, takes her out, and then marries her husband. Still with me tonight in West Palm Beach, Florida, Palm Beach County, State Attorney Dave Arenberg is with us, as well as in uh, Stewart, Florida, Christopher DeSantis, who represented Marlene's uh, son. Uh, I want to go through, I want to put up on the screen, and I'm not trying to give you any hints, Dave, to you and your team, but I, I think this would be a great exhibit at trial, by the way. This is from the Palm Beach Post back in 1990, and it's a map that kind of gives you a timeline of what happened and shows how close everything is to one another. In January, Sheila Keene moves into an apartment, Sable Pine Circle in West Palm Beach. April 15th, Chrysler LeBaron reported stolen from Payless Car Rental on South Congress Avenue. Payless. I believe that's Michael Warren's business. May 24th, 6 o'clock, clown costume, makeup, orange wig, red nose, purchased at a costume shop on South Dixie Highway in West Palm Beach. May 26th, flower arrangement with bells, balloons, ribbons, purchased at Publix on Military Trail. Later, that same morning, Marlene Warren is shot at her home. Wednesday, May 30th, that Chrysler Baron is recovered at the Winn-Dixie. So there you have it. Everything's happening right in West. I mean, it's not like someone came from out of town. No, this is all very, very close to one another. Any of you have been down to West Palm Beach. So Dave Arenberg, as, as I look at everything and I look at the timeline and putting this together, this case will have a combination, am I correct, of some eyewitnesses who will talk about what they saw, what they remember from 32 years ago, as well as some forensic scientific evidence um, that was sort of uncovered a little bit later on. Yeah, you're going to have a lot of circumstantial evidence, but most cases are circumstantial. You will have some, some of the materials that you said in the video package, you know, the DNA and so forth. Interesting you mentioned about Michael Warren and Payless. Uh, we all know Payless uh, Car Rental, that's a separate company. His company was had a similar name, and there was the intended confusion there. And that's something uh, just to just to note. Um, that's one way that uh, Michael Warren allegedly got cars because of some confusions on the drop off, allegedly. So, so, oh, so wait, 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 wait. So, so let me just make this clear. Now it's all coming back to me. So Payless Rental is a is a rental company. 
He's got a car company that also uses the name Payless. Some people who might rent a car from Payless might accidentally drop it off at his business, and then maybe he keeps it, maybe he does, maybe he brings it back. That's, I, I think, what you're alluding to there. But you don't have to go into it if you, don't, if you can't. Well, you know, m maybe, maybe it could be a Chrysler LeBaron. I mean, this is the, uh, the this is the kind of thing that's out there. But, you know, without getting too much into the evidence, uh, you know, we have a lot of circumstantial evidence here, enough to prosecute. And, you know, we think the case will be a couple weeks. Um, it depends a lot on the defense, but it should not be one of these Johnny Depp cases that takes many months. And hopefully we can finally do justice for Marlene Warren and her family. Yeah. Um, and Christopher DeSantis, we're almost out of time here, but I'll give you the, the, the final word because I know you've, you've carried this uh, on your shoulders uh, for a while because of that conversation that you had. Um, are you going to pay attention to the trial? Are you going to go to the trial? No, I'm not going to go to the trial. I have faith in the system. Palm Beach County has a, a tradition of fine lawyers and fine judges. And I can tell you, first off, I, I've never seen anything... Uh, that was inappropriate at, at the Palm Beach County State Attorney's Office, uh, unlike some other places, but that's another point. But uh, I anticipate it's going to be quite a trial, a very complicated trial counsel on both sides. And obviously, the theme of it is going to be very intriguing in and of itself. But you know, personally, I don't have a grudge one way or another. I've never met more, uh, uh, Sheila King, and I'm not really connected with anything there. I suspect that, in my opinion, that the state probably would like to work out a deal with her and implicate a, probably a person who may or may not be uh, equally, if not more, responsible. But uh, that that's another day. Yeah. Well, we shall see how that all works out. Obviously, Court TV will be covering it. Uh, Dave Arenberg, uh, great to see you. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Christopher DeSantis, great to meet you and, and appreciate your insight into this case as well. All right, when we come back, Sheila Keen Warren has been locked up for a while. She's been writing some letters to her husband. We've got some copies of those letters. We'll show them to you, and we'll bring in some folks who can maybe take a listen and a look and read between the lines. Visit us online. There she is. That's Marlene Warren. Um, and there's Sheila Keen Warren. Sheila Keen Warren arrested in 2017 for the murder of Marlene May Warren. Now, they're not related. They just both, at some point, were married or are married to Michael Warren. You see, Marlene was married to Michael. And then Sheila, according to prosecutors, shot and killed Marlene and then moved on and married Michael. So Sheila and Michael still together, but not really together because Sheila's been locked up. Now, Michael hasn't been charged with anything, uh, denies any involvement, and says that um, Sheila Keene didn't do it. They should be looking for some uh, a hitman uh, somewhere that may have done it. He says there might be evidence of that. You may hear about something like that at trial. I'm not sure what the defense is going to be. However, what we do know is that Sheila married Michael after Marlene was murdered, and now she's been locked up for five years, and she's been writing some love letters that I want to take a look at in a second. First, I want to introduce our guests who are joining us. Uh, tonight in Orlando, Florida, psychotherapist and CEO of Life Counseling Solutions, Dr. Janie Lacey is with us. And in Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert witness, and columnist of Inside the Criminal Mind, Dr. Carol Lieberman. Great to see you both tonight. So while I have you here, let me um, show you some of the portions of some of these letters that were written between, I think, 2018 and 2020 while she's locked up for the murder of her husband's first wife. Let's listen. December 19th, 2018. Hey, baby, this year is almost over, and I hope that it won't be long now, and I will be out here next year. I miss you so very, 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 very much. I'm always thinking and praying for you. Your loving wife forever and always. My dearest love, 
There is no words to describe how much I love and miss you. I feel empty inside, and my whole body aches for you. You are a part of me, and I will always feel you with me, even though you are so many miles away. I long to be in your arms and to share all these feelings with you. This is the most miserable time, the time that we are apart, but we will survive. It's only temporary. Hang in there and be strong. You are such a good and loving and caring man. Don't let other people harden you. Don't let them have the satisfaction of taking any of your spirit away from you. You are good. You are a lion, the king. My dearest sweetheart, the days are so long and silent without you. I can't wait for this nightmare to end. Jesus, please continue to keep me strong is what I pray for. I never could find the right words to tell you how much I love you or how you make my life complete. I feel that my actions speak louder than words. So I hope you have no doubts. Sending you all the love I could fit into this envelope. I love and miss you so much. I hate that I've been away for so long. Here are some more recipes, but instead of chicken, I would use pork. I'm looking forward to us making some great meals together. I think of food a lot, but I only miss you. I would give everything up just to be with you. Food would just be a bonus. My faithful and loving husband, I miss seeing your smiling face and that lift of your eyebrow. I do have a picture of you in my mind, but that is not the same. I miss everything about you and our family and friends. A happy thought, I just got back from my hour outside. It was sunny and a nice breeze. I get a visit from Charles tonight and I get to talk to you. I love and miss you so very much and my thoughts and prayers are always with you. My dearest love, I love and miss you so much. I think about you all the time. I want to come home. I hate being in this little room all of the time, day in, day out. It's so wrong to be treated this way. I would never wish this on anyone, and I don't see how anyone could hold a person so long like they do. If they were made to stay here like me, they would have a whole book of new rules. If a person isn't mental when they come in, they sure will be mental when they leave. My dearest love, today is Sunday and another week has passed. 30 days until my next court date. I wish time would go by faster for me, but as you know, it doesn't. Days seem like weeks. I'm confident my innocence will be proven. I just want to have the opportunity to help others stay on the right track and don't let drugs and tough get them in trouble. It's so devastating for everyone when something happens to a loved one. No one can understand until it happens to them. I hope no one ever has to go through this like me. Forever your loving wife. Wow. All right. Janie, I'll let you go first. Uh, your impressions of, of what we just heard uh, from Sheila Keen Warren in these letters from inside the jail. Well, my first impression is I think of addictive love, right? So working with so many women where they get into these fantasy type relationships and they're obsessive and they're filled with these um, fantastical love ideals. And sometimes we see that they hold on to these certain types of standards. And when I'm hearing these letters and the words that she's using, I'm hearing fantasy, I'm hearing obsessive love, and I'm hearing also keeping hope alive on the other side, potentially not knowing what her husband is thinking. Dr. Carol Lieberman, what, what did you hear from Sheila Keen's love letters? Well, I see it a little differently. Um, I see it as she's trying too hard to convince him that she will be his loving wife forever. She doesn't want him to to take up with another woman, in other words. You know, she was his mistress uh, when he was married to Marlene. And um, she doesn't want that to happen to her. She doesn't want him to forget her. And I think th there's also something else that you know, um, Marlene had had told her parents that um, if anything happened to her, that they should look at Michael. You know, he would have, it, it was him who did something to her. Now, he has an alibi for that particular time, but... Um, but, you know, it's funny, he said, I think a hit man did it. There are also hit women. 
And I think that that that's what um, the killer clown did. I think they were working in cahoots, really. And she's trying in these letters to um, to cement that, to like remind him of you know their close bond and so on. She is like that. What really is fascinating is that she is like. Um, she put a clown twist on the Long Island Lolita story. You know, Amy Fisher, she had an affair with this man who also had a business with cars. He was doing a, he was a body shop owner. Joey, Joey Buttafuoco. Yes, you remember him. And this man, Michael, is a car rental or whatever. He does something with cars too. So, so, um, the, so, so Sheila uh, did, you know, she came up to the door albeit dressed as a clown, and she shot uh, the wife in the face, just like Amy Fisher did. So, and, and the reason why I think that's uh, germane is because apparently in prison, she has been reading uh, romance novels and reading um, um, murder mysteries, you know, crime stories. And, uh, and she, of course, she is the embodiment of both of those. And I, so I think it's not far-fetched to think that before she did this crime, over the years when the whole Long Island Lolita thing was happening, that she was paying a lot of attention to that. She may, very well may have. Um, Dr. Janey, we only have like a, a few seconds left here in this segment, but did you hear anything in those letters that would make you think that last minute she might seek some sort of a deal and maybe provide some information on someone else who may be involved in all of this? Well, I potentially heard a lot of manipulation, you know, to Dr. Lieberman's point, right? So her being this intensity, we're hearing intense language, we're hearing all of these things. So I would imagine when her husband is reading these letters, he's knowing what's going on there. So potentially there potentially is some alibi that may, may come out. We shall see. All right, Dr. Jenny Lacey, Dr. Carol Lieberman staying with us. Uh, when we come back, we're going to take a, a listen to uh, Marlene's son, um, who spoke about what happened that day as well. Also, coming up next hour. In Waukesha, Wisconsin, the accused Christmas parade killer in court representing himself for the murder of six people, including an eight-year-old boy. Tonight, we are live from the courthouse with the latest. Have you read or seen a complaint in this matter in you at any time? Objection is irrelevant. Grounds. Overruled, she may answer. Sorry, what was the question? Have you seen or read the complaint? No, I don't know what complaint is being referred to, no. It was a holiday parade that quickly turned tragic. Evil has arrived and it's shown what it can do. Darrell Brooks is accused of killing six people when he drove his vehicle through a crowd of spectators. In a surprising move, Brooks waived his right to an attorney and instead will be representing himself. Our cameras will be inside the courtroom as a community searches for justice. The Deadly Parade Crash Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, 9, 8 central, only on 14. 30 years ago, a person dressed as a clown, holding flowers and balloons, rang the doorbell at Marlene Warren's home. But when Marlene answered, the clown shot her to death. Advanced DNA testing led authorities to Sheila Keen Warren. The defendant ended up marrying the victim's husband. It's like a lifetime movie plot. This is going to be a riveting case. The Killer Clown Murder Trial. Live coverage starting October 21st on Court TV. October 21st, it all starts the killer clown trial right here on Court TV. Uh, we've been taking a closer look at the case uh, all hour. Still with us, uh, Dr. Janie Lacey, psychotherapist and forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Carol Lieberman. I want to play for you both. Um, this is Marlene's son, who was 20 years old at the time, but was at the home with some friends when that doorbell rang. And, and, and the clown shot and killed his mother. Um, let's take a listen. Uh, it was close. Uh, we were best friends. She was all. She was uh, my my life. Um, I look at myself and I still see her in me. The caring, loving heart. The day you lost your mom, do you remember like just what, what were you, was it just kind of a normal morning? Were you just having breakfast? Or what do you remember about that morning? Well, I remember um, I have gotten a car accident and I had a cast on my leg. and. Um, 
Yeah, it was just a regular morning. Um, <clears throat> we were pretty much all together, you know, um, right there at the door, and uh, she answered it. I was at a loss. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I felt my heart, my soul just get ripped out of my body. And it, uh, it was a tragic thing. What would you say, um, you know, if Sheila Keen is convicted, what would you say, like, if you could speak to her face to face, what would you want her to know that she took from you? She took my life <clears throat> um, out of selfishness and greed. And um, I would tell her there's still help. Um, there's still time for help. So for Joe Ahrens, who, who lost his mom, he's lost, he lost other members of his family prior to that happening. Um, he's a witness in all of this, uh, Dr. Janey. Um, he's going to have to testify. And I believe part of his prior description of the clown was that it was a man. So the defense is going to do a lot to go after him and his initial description of, of who shot and killed his mom. But what, what do you suspect that moment is going to be like for him uh, when he takes the stand? Well, when we consider that something that normal day and something that someone did not anticipate happening, especially a 20-year-old boy, 20-year-old young man, right? Of course, we can understand that the shock and all the details get fuzzy because your world just got ripped up. You know, you didn't anticipate this. You've lost the most important person in your life. So looking back, it is very normal for survivors of watching and vicariously looking through different devastating situations have fuzzy memories because of the way that the brain works and the way that the shock and all that stuff happens. So it's anticipated and it's normal from our perspective. But I understand that he probably is going to have to recall and have a lot of uh, resiliency to be able to go back to those devastating memories where his life was forever changed in that grief process. Yeah, it, I mean, he's been waiting a long time, Dr. Carol Lieberman, for this moment. Um, and finally, it's going to happen. I, I think he probably probably believes others may be involved. At least one other may be involved, but has not been charged. Um, what are your thoughts about what that's going to be like for Joe Ahrens? Well, you know, on the one hand, it's going to be really hard facing all these memories again. On the other hand, it could be very cathartic. Um, you know, perhaps he thought that it was a man just because... Uh, you know, because to men, it's usually men who are clowns, like in the circus and so on. But I, I thought what he remembered the most about the, the clown was that they had brown eyes, which presumably um, Sheila has. And so, you know, I would say that that, that would help. But, you know, the connection is... Um, uh, her husband uh, had said she was having her, uh, the marriage was falling apart and he was the uh, husband was in fact um, he had hit her and so on and um, he didn't want to divorce though because he didn't want to lose half of what they had acquired and most of the property was in her name so that is how um, Sheila comes in as the potential hitman that you know she wants a relationship with him first of all and what better way <laughs> in some way of thinking uh, to get his attention, to get his love, to get his appreciation forever than to, you know, take care of his wife so that he gets all the money and, and they can be together. Um, you know, it's, it's really, um, it really is, of course, incredibly sad, but um, that it, it's a really interesting dynamic between the two of them because both of them, assuming that this is true, um, both you know he doesn't he knows that she holds all the cards in the in the a way Sheila does because um, yes she's in in jail but um, she could tell the fact that he knew that she was going to kill his wife or something like that, if in fact that, that is the case. So it's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting dynamic between the two of them. Absolutely. Dr. Janie Lacey, Dr. Carol Lieberman, appreciate your time and insight tonight. We'll see you again really, really soon. Thank you. Thank you.